The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. These guys aren't playing around. These guys aren't playing around. It's time to put the books away and get in the room. It's time for Wrestling Recess. Now your hosts, Dyson Gould and Dom Deputy. PA Power Wrestling. PA Power Wrestling. Pennsylvania is wrestling. What's up going on, wrestling fans? You're now tuned into the PA Power Wrestling Recess Podcast. I am your host, Dyson Gold, joined as always by Dominic Deputy. Today we'll be discussing USA's performance at Worlds, my junior high big board, and Justin McCoy will also be joining us on the show later. Yeah, Dyson, it's been a while since we were able to finally record and get another podcast out to everyone. Can't wait to discuss everything. So, a lot going on in the wrestling world right now. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. So uh, let's get started with our uh, Worlds recap. Uh, Let's start off with Greco. So Greco was a little bit uh, disappointing with only one weight qualifying for the Olympics, which is uh, Max Nowry, who got fifth place. Yeah, and then he he went two and two, though. So, I mean, that's not bad overall. And they had... Yeah, I was kind of surprised that uh, Adam Kuhn didn't place. I was kind of expecting him to place. I didn't really know much about uh, Greco going into uh, this tournament, and especially this freestyle and Greco season. But now I know a little bit more about the Greco guys and stuff. And definitely going into this tournament, Adam Kuhn was definitely the Greco guy that I knew the best, and I was kind of expecting him to medal, but he did not, and I was kind of surprised by that. Yeah, USA only had... Not only, but they had eight wins. So I mean, it's better. I think it's a better performance than last year because they last year they had Adam Kuhn who got second, but then like nobody else did very well. I don't think. But then this year they everybody did like not terrible, but they did okay. Like I think there's like two people that didn't win a match. Kuhn, Stefano didn't, and so three that didn't win a match. Kuhn, Stefano, it's in. Pat Smith. Everybody else won at least one match. Yeah. They didn't do too bad, but it's just, uh, it was really, uh, everyone was pumped up going into Worlds and kind of really excited for it, and then Greco kind of really didn't get us started off on a great note, but then, uh, the women were able to pick it up a little bit. They got third place, and we'll talk a little- three world champs. Yep, three world champs. They broke the American record with three world champs. Jakara Winchester- Adeline Gray, who also broke the record with five world titles by any American, and um, Tamara Mensa Stock won a world title. Yeah, I'm from Jakara and uh, Tamara. I'm actually getting a shirt that they're getting signed for me from the team, so I'm pretty excited for that. Yeah, Tamara and uh, Jakara. The really the whole uh, USA women's team seems like uh, really nice people and fun people to be around. Yeah, but really, I think all rest like almost all wrestlers on the world team have to be nice to be around because you know they have to have that like attitude and like if they are not nice to be around, nobody's gonna want to drill with them in practice. So I mean, they kind of have to be nice because they're not nice. They are not gonna do anything because they won't. Nobody want to drill with them. Yeah. So uh, first. Whitney Condor went at 50 kilograms, went 0-1, and uh, 53 kilograms, Sarah Hildebrandt went 1-2. and two. Yeah, I was very disappointed about that. Yeah. Uh, she Yeah, she was a returning silver medalist and uh, only ended up winning one match. Yeah, I. what was she ranked? She was seated pretty high. She was like top yeah. three, wasn't she? Yeah, I I'm not sure where she, exactly she was, but I think she was ranked pretty high. And then at 55 kilograms was Jakara Winchester who came out with the gold. And uh 57 kilograms, Jenna Burkett went 1 and 1. Yeah. I was hoping the Joker did pretty good, but guess not. And then back to Jakara, she had a heck of a tournament. Like yeah. She did unreal. I really didn't know much about her going into the tournament. 
And uh, then she was one of the first ones to, one of the first women to compete. And then I was just like, whoa, we got a finalist. And then I kind of, then I kind of started paying attention to her. And I saw that she won and I was happy for her and uh, proud of the United States and happy that we got a champion. Yeah, after she lost last year, she said something about, like, winning it or something, I think. Pretty sure that's what I heard in an interview. Yeah. And then at uh, 59 kilograms was uh, Allie Regan, and she went 0-1, and, and I was I was kind of, I was pretty disappointed about that one. I was kind of, she's a Hawkeye Wrestling Club girl, so I was kind of really cheering for her and uh, really wanted her medal. So I was kind of sad about that one. Yeah, and then Kayla Miracle coming in at 62 kilograms went two and one. So, I mean, that's pretty good. But I guess it didn't get her enough. Yeah, wasn't too, ba- wasn't too bad, but uh, not quite enough for the medal. And uh, 65 kilograms was Forrest Molinari. She uh, fall, she fell in the bronze medal match and got tech fouled, but uh, she was. She lost a heartbreaker in the semifinals, 5-5, five, five, which that was I was really sad about that one. I really wanted to see her win a world title and just she was she was just right there 5-5 five, five in the semis and almost made the world finals and then end up losing in the bronze medal match. I didn't know it was possible for her to lose when she got her forced angry face on, but <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and then at uh 68 kilograms was uh Tamara Mensa Stock and she won a world title. Uh, she looked really good, and, uh, I heard her say after her interview, or during her interview, that after, uh, Bader asked her that when, when did she believe that she could, uh, win a world title, and she said that last year after she lost, she believed that she could do it, and, uh, she kept telling herself that she could beat anyone, and now she's a world champ. Yeah, and then, was it Sarah Dosho that was the returning Olympic medalist, or gold medalist, or... Yeah, she beat someone uh, pretty good, I remember. Yeah, I think, I think it was Sarah, Sarah Deschaux. And then she, like, cl- closest match, I think, was 6-1 against Nigeria. Yeah. And um, at 72 kilograms, Victoria Francis went got fifth place and went 1-2. Uh, and two. Yeah, and she had that match against Palaha locked up, but... Like she not locked up, but she was winning one nothing, and then kind of lost her lead. Cause I yeah. remember the announcers saying, "Can she? All she has to do now is hold her lead. Can she do it?" And then she lost it. Yeah, and then at uh, seventy six kilograms to uh, end it off for the women's, Adeline Gray broke the record for any American and won the fifth her fifth world title. Which is pretty impressive. That's better than John Smith and uh Yeah, she beat JB. Uh, yeah, she beat uh John Smith and Jordan Burroughs past them. Yeah, so on to uh uh men's freestyle. You got Dayton Fix who went one and one, which I was pretty disappointed. I really thought he could do better, but I mean Sam Herring had him go into the semifinals, was it? Yeah. Judging from everyone's predictions, I was like, oh, man, he's probably, like, I figured he would do pretty well, but I was like, oh, man. At 61 kilograms, Tyler Graff comes in, was it a fifth place finish? Yeah, he uh, lost in the bronze medal match, so he did uh, qualify the weight for the Olympics. And uh, also at 57 kilograms was uh, Stefan Michik from Michigan wrestling for Serbia. He lost in the bronze medal match, and he had a pretty good tournament. He lost in a bronze medal match four three. I was actually watching the story he or watching a uh, thing, and I heard people say that him and Malik Amin, he won. Uh, was it Serbia's first match or first medal at the World Championships? And then Malik Amin won San Marino's first ever match at the World Championships. Yeah. So that's pretty cool because they're best friends. So it's like, wow. And then coming in at 65 kilograms, Zane Rutherford, who went 0-1. That was a little bit uh, disappointing after, I mean, all that they went through uh, with the arbitration process and everything. 
uh, but uh, I mean, hey, he, he, it was. I don't think there's anything wrong with the the way we make our world teams. Uh, it was just he was the guy, fair and square. He they went through the arbitration process. They gave Yanni a rematch, and uh, Zane beat him fair and square. So he was the world team rep. So that, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I do think I think the arbitration process might have hurt Zane a little bit because it wouldn't have given the coaches enough time, or really almost any time at all, other than uh, acclimation camp, to really focus on him and have him prepare for the foreign guys. So, because Zane was pretty much preparing for Yanni the whole summer, trying to beat him and make the world team the whole way up until September second, and. Uh, now he had to come here and wrestle the foreign guys, not really having enough uh, preparation for the foreign guys. He was pretty much just pre- preparing for uh, Yanni. Yeah, that was kind of a heartbreaker, which, I mean, I hope they can qualify that weight then because I'm really excited to see. I want to I wanna see Yanni wrestle at the international level. Like, I w- I'm w- like I'm... I want to see how he does. Yeah, and uh, Yanni beat the guy who got bronze at... Uh, yeah, Bajrang. Yeah, and then he also beat Musagaya, Musakayev, who also got bronze, with the two bronze spots. Yeah, so, and then you got, uh, according to Flo, Dave Bave at gold medal at 70 kilograms. Yeah, and uh, for USA, James Green went uh, one and one, which uh, it wasn't... He wasn't too bad, but it was a little bit disappointing, expecting a little bit more from him, a little bit of a veteran kind of going into the tournament and uh, only going one and one But, hey, I mean, it's the world championships. You can't really expect. I mean, he's, you're, having, you're wrestling tough opponents every match. so Yeah, so, like, anybody at the world championships, you can't say, oh, man, you're bad or you're anything – criticizing them like you can say how they wrestled but like you can't criticize them like they're you're not good or anything because that's the world championships i mean they're the best in the world yeah and like i mean it's even hard to make the team like it's like you think about like yanni zane like just that those like that's hard to make the team and then like 74 kilograms with jb and imar imar gave Jordan burrows uh heck of a match and like a crazy good match and it was hard to make the team for Jordan Burroughs so like it's nothing easy to get on the team and then to go here and do well was even harder yeah and James Green had to beat Jason Nolf, Ryan Deacon people like that that's crazy yeah Ryan Deacon's a junior silver medalist he had to beat him just to uh make the team yeah and then coming in at 79 Kyle Dake wins another world medal, gold medal. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and then uh, to, at 74 kilograms, uh, Sidikoff, I have to say, Sidikoff is a very good wrestler. I mean, he pretty much, he dominated that bracket. I mean, he beat Tremizo 5-2 in the finals. He beat Burroughs with, uh, he pushed Burroughs out with, uh, 1.3 seconds left to go in the match, and I was, I was kind of disappointed about that. I mean, I kind of thought maybe Burroughs being a veteran, I don't really think he should get pushed out But with 1.3 seconds left. But, I mean, hey, it's a cough. He's really good, so. Yeah, isn't that the second time he's lost? I think he lost to him last year, correct? I think so, because I think I saw I saw somewhere that uh, Sidikoff's record against Tremizo and Burroughs is 5-0 and combined. Which, yes, I mean, so that's crazy because, I mean, Chamizo and Burroughs aren't any, like, scrubs. They're, like, world-class, one of the best, and he's 5-0 and against them. Yeah, that's Burroughs' second loss for... So, Sidikov's the only person that beat him twice I internationally? Believe, I believe so. Or, yeah. Chamizo might have beaten him twice, but I'm not sure. I think what I saw was he didn't, but was... Sidikov was first, but so Kyle Dake had an unbelievable performance, and then 86, 
the Pat the Pat Debunk Downey. Yeah. Comes in with two and one. He uh, he he actually looked pretty good with uh, Tech Falls, or he had a Tech Falls his first match, and he looked pretty good his second match, and then uh, first match or third match, excuse me, he lost, and then uh, he actually ended up scoring uh, four team points, and USA beat Iran by three for bronze, and uh, so without, I mean if. If he wouldn't have won a match and got his zero points, we wouldn't have gotten third place. So without Pat Downey, we would we wouldn't have gotten bronze. And um, he also scored more points than Gwiz, Fix, Green, and Rutherford combined because they all had zero. So I mean, Pat, Pat Downey, everyone, uh, some people doubted him coming in. He he definitely showed that he he can do pretty well on the international level. Yeah. So, and then. Uh, did you hear about the one Iranian media member who came up to the one of the flow guys and asked what debunk meant because there was no translation? Yeah. And then they also yeah. asked why we call him homeless. <laughs> that was pretty funny. And then you come up to the at ninety two to the alien Jaden Cox, who's just who can chop at people's legs and make them. He is fall. unbelievable. He's he is one of the best. He. He went through there and did not give up a point. He 4-0 first match, 3-0 second match, 8-0 third match, 11-0 semis, and then 4-0 in the finals to win. I mean, that's just he hasn't been he hasn't been taken down since last year's semifinals, which means he we went he didn't get taken down at the Yasar Dogu, the Pan Ams, beat the streets, or two matches with Bor Nickel, and that's. Or this year's worlds. I mean, that's just unbelievable. He's. I'm really excited to see like where he'll go for the Olympics because 92 is a non-Olympic weight. So if he'll go up to 97 and try to go get Snyder and then essentially get uh, Sajulayev in the at world or at Olympics, and then or if he'll go down to 86 and wrestle David Taylor, or and then uh, try to get Yazdani in the, at the Olympics. Well, to be the if he goes up to ninety seven and wins it, the Olympics guaranteed number one pound for pound. Yeah, like that that'd be unbelievable to take off, to take out Snyder and uh, Sajulayev in the same year would be unbelievable. Now speaking of Snyder, I was like he wrestled well, but I was pretty disappointed when I saw he lost to Sheriff Sheriffov. Yeah, it was uh. I mean, he still end up getting bronze for the United States, but I mean, I really wanted to see uh, Sajulayev Snyder. Third place isn't too bad at the World Championships. So, and then uh, also speaking of non-Olympic weights for Kyle Dake uh, at seventy-nine kilograms, that is not an Olympic weight. So he will he will either have to go seventy-four and take out Jordan Burroughs and Imar. Or go eighty six and take out David Taylor, and, and then uh, possibly Jaden Cox. So I'd say yeah, the best move would be to go down. I mean, eighty six if Cox goes down and Tate goes up would be unbelievable. I mean, Cox is like one of the best wrestlers in the world, and then you have David Taylor, a uh, world champ, and uh, Kyle Dake, a two time world champ and four time NCAA champ. That weight would be stacked. Yeah, but. I really think that that he in an interview he said I think you know where I'm going when his weight was at when his weight came up for the Olympics. I mean even if he goes down to 74 that'd still be a him and Burroughs is that'd be a great match between them two. Yeah, I think he'd have a better chance going down though. Yeah, that between Burroughs and Dake I'd have to take Dake I think. Bur- but Burroughs, well, I guess Dake does have good two leg, like high crotch double defense. That's yeah. what he specializes in with his Dake bombs. So, and then you, Nick Gwiazdowski lost 0 and 1, lost 5 to 2 to an Iranian. I was definitely a little bit uh, uh, disappointed in that uh, performance. I was, I was expecting him to medal, and. Uh, because uh, at the Dogu, he did really well and got silver. And then I was kind of, 
kind of could tell like he was right there to them top level guys and I was kind of expecting him to medal and now and he went 0 and 1 so it's kind of disappointing in that yeah but for 125 kilograms I had I figured Deha at goal would win but uh the um Gino Petriashvili really made some noise yeah and then now talking about a little bit of a uh, NCAA news uh Returning national champion Nick Soriano is going to take an Olympic red shirt. What are your thoughts about that, Dominic, and how it opens up the 133-pound weight class? With also, uh, Dayton Fix said after his uh, interview at Worlds, he said that he is most likely going to be taking an Olympic red shirt. So, I mean, if they both take it, it really opens up the weight class. I guess he now has the top game locked up for the best at 133 because Fix is out. So, I mean, that's a wide open spot for really anyone who wants to upset Seth Gross. Yeah, I'd definitely have to say my pick now for uh, NCAAs at 133 would definitely be uh, Seth Gross. Um, and then has Michik announced that he's taken an Olympic red shirt yet? Because if not, I'm pretty. Sh- I'm. I bet he will. Yeah, I, he. Because I have to say he would. Yeah, because because he lost like. And what was the score of against him and Atli? Uh, I'm not sure, but he. I mean, he uh, qualified the weight already. Already, so uh, he's right there. And uh, if he qualif- if he wrestles for Serbia again, which I'm sure he will, he he'll probably qualify for the Olympics for the Serbian uh, team. So uh, my pick for 133 would definitely be Seth Gross. With that weight's pretty opened up now, taking the the runner up and the national champ from last year out of there. Yeah, I think like anybody who like who is available to wrestle for another country that like say if Bo Nickel could wrestle for another country, I'd say he would. Not just to, like in a regular year because I don't think he's beaten Jaden Cox. Yeah. So I. If I was him, I'd probably go to another country to compete because then you might not even get to compete at all with the world championships. And now before we talk about some more wrestling news, uh, let's bring on Justin McCoy and talk to him for a little bit. Now joining us on the show, Pennsylvania native and Virginia wrestler Justin McCoy. How's it going, Justin? I'm good. How are you guys? Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. So uh, our first question is, how and when were you introduced to the sport of wrestling? Um, I was introduced to the sport when I was around five years old. That's when I started, and um, my mom was a babysitter, and um, I think she she was either babysitting one of the my elementary coach's kids, or he came for some reason to my house and gave me like a, a paper that said something about wrestling and um he kind of asked me if I wanted to do it and I said yes and it all started from there did you love the sport right away or did you kind of just do it um at first it was it was just like something something to do for fun um didn't really care if I won or lost and then um after a couple years I would say like around eight or nine years old, I started getting really serious about it and wanting to, you know, win every tournament and and do well instead of just, like, having fun and not caring if I lost. Or... What other sports did you play growing up? Uh, I played baseball and football. What was your favorite of between baseball and football? Um, Growing up, it was probably... It was probably baseball, but then, uh, like, as I got older and definitely in high school, I loved football a lot more. (laughs) Did your parents play a big role in your career? Yeah, they they probably played the biggest role in my career. They um, they're the ones that that took me to every tournament and um, every practice and. They tried to get me the best competition so that I would get better because they knew how much I 
I loved the sport and how much I cared about it, and they wanted to see me succeed, so they did everything they could to help me get there. Is there something, if anything, you wish you did differently in your career early on? I mean, one thing would probably be just to relax more and have fun um, and not not focus on winning. I know that obviously I, I wanted to win every every tournament, every match, but that's I don't think that's the important thing. I think the most important thing is not not focusing on the outcome like of a match, just focusing on like what I could do better in that match, like always giving my best effort, always hustling when I'm wrestling and um, trying to score points. So, yeah, I would just try to not focus on on winning, winning or losing, just focus on giving my best out there for a whole, you know, six minutes or seven minutes, however long the match is. So I wanted to ask some questions about Young Guns. When did you start to go to Young Guns? Um, I think I started to go when I was like seven years old. Um, and I went there till I was in, till like I, I graduated high school. Dyson and I as fellow Young Guns wrestlers know how loaded the room is with talent. Can you talk a little bit about the partners you had at Young Guns? Yeah, I, um, there were so many, so many good partners at Young Guns and I actually have some teammates that went to Young Guns that are on UVA the wrestling team right now with me. Um, but that that room is how I got better. Um, I wrestled guys that were way better than me and that beat me up during practices. And um, it just helped me get better. It helped me try to, every single day, I would try to do something better against that person. Like, if I couldn't score on him, I would try to, you know, get to his legs at least once during that practice or, like, and then keep building on that. And um, if I if I finally got to his legs, I'd try to finish, get a takedown, just trying to build, like, little bits at a time. But, yeah, the room was filled with crazy talent. You got, like, Jason Nolf and Spencer Lee, Cam Coy, um, Max Murin. Caleb Young, Michael Kemmer, just so many guys that uh, can help you get so much better. When did you start to see your time at Young Guns pay off? Um, I think it really started to pay off um, probably around when I was like 11 years old. Um, that's when I won my uh, PJW state title and um, I don't know, it just helped me realize how good I was kind of getting and uh, gave me a lot of confidence. What was the biggest thing you took from your time at Young Guns? Um, I think the biggest thing would be uh, just doing everything right on and off the mat. Um, so in my life, like when I'm not on the mat, just uh, doing the right things, treating people right, treating my family right, loving them. Um, and and just not getting into the bad stuff around this world, drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. So, um, and then on the mat, um, I think doing the right things as in uh, just giving my best out there and not worrying about the outcome and uh, just hustling every single point and just the whole entire match. Did you have good relationships with John and Jody? Yeah, I did. Um, they were, I, I had pretty good relationships because I, I knew them for so long. And um, they they really helped me a lot through throughout my time there. And um, they had a big influence on me. So, yeah, I was, I was close to them. I was able to stay at their house a couple times and do some camps. And um, they always welcomed me no matter what. If you had to describe John and Jody with one sentence each, how would you describe them? Let's start with Jody. I'd probably describe Jody as like, a hu- I'd say a hustler. <laughs> he like, he he always was, he was the one that was really um, 
fond of me about, you know, giving my best the whole entire match and, and always hustling. He always liked to talk about hustling. You hustle out there no matter what. If you go out of bounds, you hustle back to the center. And um, you're hustling when you're out there every, to score every point. And so, yeah, I call him the hustler. <laughs> now, how about John? Uh, I would call John the warrior <laughs> because he's all about getting in there and making a fight. And, like, he always likes to say grinding you grind out there and so he's he's always um i'd say he's a warrior because he wants you to get out there and make it a war moving on to your time at uh chestnut ridge could you talk a little bit about your time there uh yeah that was that was some of the best years of my life in high school wrestling for chestnut ridge because um i had a pretty successful career there and not only did I, but our team did. So it was fun to uh, just contribute and give my best to my team. And um, we we were able to place at States my freshman year as a team and, and got second. And then we fell a little bit short my sophomore and junior year and then ended up getting third my senior year. Um, so it was nice to, to finish it off my senior year after a hard loss but we were able to finish and get third, which is really cool. But um, just myself, it was it was a lot of fun wrestling those four years. I placed four times. Um, I got seventh, sixth, or I got sixth, then seventh, then first, then second. Um, but I, you know, it was it was a fun time, and I'm I'm glad to have went through all that. If you had to describe Coach Depp in just one short sentence, what would you say? I would say he, I would say he's he's a great person and um, he's kind of a goon at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's real serious when it comes to when it comes to practice and and wrestling and um, but there's times when he can he can just totally lose that focus and and start joking around with you but i think he's a he's a great coach and a great mentor just like some of those trips in the fun van oh yeah the fun van the fun van was that was some of the best best times too it was always what happens in the fun van stays in the fun van so um but yeah you had to be a certain type of fun to be in there and even if you're cutting weight you had to you had to uh, find a way to get in a good mood when you're in there. And, but it was always more fun to to be in the fun van after after a tournament when you're all stuffed and full from eating so much. If you had to describe uh, Coach Lazar, how would you describe him? Um, I think Coach Lazar is one of the people that had the most biggest effects on me. He um, He really, like made me become a man you know I think I was a boy when I came into to high school and he changed me around and made me become a man and made me work harder and he he saw the potential that I had and um he really just he he's also he's kind of like Jody he made me do things right on and off the mat so Chris Laz is just a great person all around what was your mindset like going into the state tournament? Well, I think I had a couple different mindsets. Um, I'd say throughout the four years, I would say like my freshman year, um, I think I, I didn't have the greatest mindset. I kind of, I knew that I, I had, I was, I was good and I had potential to do really good. And, but I wish that I would have believed in myself and knew that I could win it all. And I don't think I did that. I think I, um, I just thought like I can place, like I don't, I don't know if I can win though. So I think my mindset was to just, just kind of give my best, but I didn't have enough confidence in myself. And then um, my sophomore year, um, it's hard to tell what my mindset was there because I think I should have done a lot better. I wrestled a kid. I lost in the quarterfinals 
lost in the quarterfinals my freshman and sophomore year, but and it was kind of the quarterfinal round was like always the the nervous round for me for some reason. But um, I lost in the quarterfinals my sophomore year to a kid that I beat at Super 32, and he beat me bad. He beat me like 12-4 or something. It was pretty bad, and um, so I was really disappointed. I didn't wrestle how I should have. I wasn't going out there to score points and and not worry about winning or losing because all I wanted to do was win, and I think that was the wrong mindset. And then um, my junior year, I went out there, and uh, just the whole season I was – scoring or looking to score points and not worrying about winning I was wrestling like the best guys and uh John Pippa I wrestled him my one of the first tournaments of the year and he was ranked I think number one and I shocked him and I beat him and um then I actually wrestled him in the state finals but um I was just looking to score points and no matter what keep wrestling and I think that that's really what helped me win a state title that year. And I think I did that a lot my senior year, except for the finals match when I think I just had like a, I don't know, a little a little mental issue in the finals or something. I just didn't wrestle to, to score points and not worry about winning or losing because I wanted to win so bad for a second time. But yeah, just I think the biggest, the best mindset I had is scoring points, trying to score points and not worry about winning or losing. Could you talk about your experience wrestling at who's number one in the snake pit? Yeah, that was um that was a really fun time. Uh I it was kind of unexpected because I was ranked I think sixth in the country and usually number one and number two wrestle there, so I didn't expect to to get a call and all of a sudden I'm in class and I get called down to the office and my um, principal who was my football coach he's like he said someone was on the phone for me and it was pretty sure it was Jody Strip Matter and he was like hey um, Brayton Lee or the one kid was hurt and he said number two kid Brayton Lee wants to wrestle you who's number one do you want to wrestle and at first I was kind of hesitant because I was like or he said you, you have one week to get ready and I was like oh man because I was just playing football and not really wrestling much at that time and uh, he's like you have one week to get ready and I was like oh crap I don't know if I can do that so um and I kind of hesitated I'm like I don't know but then um I said that I would and I'm so glad I did because not many people get that opportunity to wrestle um in that type of environment and at something like that an event like that so um, but yeah, wrestling there, it was, it was awesome. I had, I lost, but I had a lot of fun. Um, and I wasn't in the best shape there. I tried to get ready in a week, but it was super hard. Um, but I came off the mat with bright red face, couldn't breathe. Um, but it was, it was fun. I had a lot of fun there. When did you know you wanted to wrestle for Virginia? It's kind of a funny story. I pretty much figured it out on the way home from my Virginia Tech visit <laughs> which is um their Virginia UVA and Virginia Tech are big rivals so um I visited both schools and um I just I got this feeling when I came to UVA that I didn't get to any other school um I just knew that this was the right place for me and that um just just because the people here and the people I have surrounding me and helping me get better through in wrestling and in life. So I just, I've had, I just got that feeling that I didn't get anywhere else. What are some other schools you were interested in? I was interested in Cornell. Um, and like I said, Virginia tech and, uh, Michigan and, um, Lehigh. Um, and like, I was obviously interested in Penn State, but, um, that was, <laughs> it's hard when they got all these really, really good guys coming in. Um, but 
Yeah, because I, I wanted to go to Penn State when I was, as I was growing up. Um, that's all the only place I wanted to go. And then I started to open up my options more as I got older and thinking about just um, my education and where I want to be after wrestling. So, but uh, yeah, um, there are a couple other schools, but those are kind of the main ones. What did Virginia like about you? Um, I think one thing that they liked about me is just that I, you know, give my best every single match, no matter what, like I'm saying, um, just trying to score, score points and hustle out there and, uh, give my best effort. And one thing that they really said that they, they liked about me and they could tell I have potential is that, um, they think I'm really athletic. They, uh, my coaches actually came to a football game of mine during high school and watched me. I can't remember if I was committed committed at that time or not, but um, they came and watched and they they I guess they liked what they saw. So, who are your practice partners at Virginia? A lo- the biggest ones are like my coaches, um, Trent and Travis Paulson. They uh, are extremely good. Um, they just beat us all up every single day when we wrestle them. But they helped us get a lot better. And um, some other ones are like Cam Coy. Um, I even wrestle with like Jack Miller once in a while. Um, and have like, we got a ton of first, like first years coming that came in this year uh, around my weight. But I have like James Whitaker. Um, Sam Martino, Sam Crevis, um, Michael Murphy, um, just a ton of guys that I wrestle with every single day. Jake Keating and um, Victor Marcelli. Just we re- we usually and I noticed one thing in college is we really spread out. Um, doesn't really matter what weight you are, you can wrestle anyone. Um, even because we do a lot of like spar far wrestling in in college and and you just got to be smart with wrestling bigger guys did you want to take your red shirt that you took your freshman year um it honestly it didn't really matter to me and I kind of kind of just let it up to the coaches and what they wanted um because uh I I just I didn't really there wasn't much said about it until my coach kind of sat me down and said, he asked me what I wanted to do. And I pretty much told him it's up to him, whatever he thinks is best for the team. Um, and he thought that, that I should redshirt. So I was all for it. Um, cause it really didn't matter to me. I, and I think that redshirting was really, really good for me. Cause I think it, it really allowed me to, to get a lot better. I was able to practice a whole year with the whole, with the team and, um, really grow in a lot of areas that I didn't even know like that I were that I needed to grow and I didn't think I could do better at all that stuff when I really could. What was the biggest thing you learned in your first year in college? I think the biggest thing is that I need to keep wrestling in every single position. Um cuz these guys in college they're they're constantly moving, constantly like trying to score and find better positions. So, um, if I stop wrestling, then I'm going to get scored on. Um, so I think that that's one of the biggest things is I got, you gotta, you gotta keep wrestling in every single position and try to score out of every single position. And that's a big, a big thing in learning how to do that is, um, doing it in practice. If you had to describe Coach Garland in one gen, in just one short sentence, what would you say? I would say Coach Garland is like a kind of a crazy man, but a great mentor mentor at the same time. He's uh, really fun to be around, and he's always he's always got a smile on his face and ready to ready to help you no matter what. Um, and yeah, like if. No matter what, he's going to help you in every area of life. He He's uh, more than just a wrestling coach, but he's a re- great wrestling coach at the same time. But, yeah, he's a, he's a great person, and he's fun to be around. How would you describe Coach Travis and Trent Paulson? Let's start with Trent. 
Um, I would say Trent is <laughs> they got both of them have some some different personalities that I've I've never seen before, but they're super um they're fun to be around too and that's why I really like these coaches because they remind me a lot of my high school coaches and um because they're they're not just all about wrestling and they and they care about you in every area of your life, not just wrestling and they want you to succeed um not just in wrestling but throughout your life and um but Trent he's uh he's a funny guy and it's hard to explain him. He's uh he's him and Travis are a little different in the way that they they talk to you and uh <laughs> like it's hard to explain. They just got some different personalities but I would say Trent is more um with wrestling, Trent's more of like a he, he likes to spar around and uh help me figure out positions but like just by wrestling and sparring and Travis is more of like a technique guy. He likes to show you how how it's done. Um like show you different techniques and before you even wrestle and then work on it while wrestling. But yeah, they're two great coaches. Do you plan to wrestle post college? Um, right now I I do plan to. Um but we'll see. You never know. Like obviously I love wrestling, but you never know if like if I fall out of love with it. Um but right now I'm still in love with wrestling, so I wanna keep doing it. I wanna keep getting better and trying to succeed. So um yeah, I want to after college and I wanna you know, make the Olympic teams and world teams and and uh just get Olympic medals and world medals. Would you like to coach in your future? Yeah, I I think so. Um and that's one thing that I really realized um throughout I think like this year is that I never really thought of coaching and now um I kind of do want to coach. I think I, I've been thinking about it, and I want to. Uh, I want to take everything that I learned so far here, and hopefully apply it to to kids to help them reach their goals. And because I've learned so much here that I never never knew that I could that that was there in wrestling. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I'd like to to coach and help kids reach their goals. That's all we got for you today, Justin. Hey, thanks for uh, talking to us for a little bit, and good luck this season. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, good luck this season. See ya. See ya. See ya. That was a great interview with Justin McCoy, and now we are going to answer some questions from our listeners. The first question is from Coach Depp. Can you guys build the perfect wrestler using each American's strengths, and what would that wrestler have from each wrestler? Example, Dake's defense. Yeah, so my f- I have a good many here. Um, my first one would be Dake's defense, definitely. Then I would have uh, Yanni's scrambling. And then you got to have that Zane fire and pace. And then you, I figured you got to have, like, I feel like Dom Demas is really good upper body, and that could be very helpful to all of our guys. And Suriano's got that great, heart and like he's not going to give up Snyder's want to get better Spencer's top game and Teasdale's slickness but there's one more you have to have the big poofy hair like Dayton Fix I'm going to go with uh, DeSanto's pace Yanni's scrambling Dake's defense and Spencer's fireman okay now for the next question from Seth Duckworth where would Daringer fall if where, where would Daringer have finished if he was somehow dropped into this bracket of 79 kilograms? I would definitely have to say second. I mean, he was he was right there with uh, Dake, and he beat a couple of them guys that got that uh, medaled, and uh, I'd definitely say he would get second. Yeah, def- I'd say that too. Uh, he, well, we don't know. If he was dropped into there along with Dake, he could have came out on top in some way. Our next question is from the great Sam Herring. What do you think caused a seemingly off year for Team USA? The draws definitely affected them. I feel they need to focus 
well, we as a country need to focus a lot more on freestyle and Greco, and I hope we can come out a lot better for 2020. And I have seen some tweets that say they're all messing with Sebi, so that's all that's they're not focused. But anyone who says that, I feel no longer has the right to live on Earth. Sebi is a pretty great sloth. I d- definitely think the jaws affected him a little bit, but. I also kind of think the extended wrestle-offs with uh, Zayn and Yanni arbitration process and Dake daring your uh, Dake holding it off a little bit. I definitely think those might affect him as well, maybe a little bit, because they're. I mean, especially affected them guys because they didn't know if they're going to be on the team or not, or especially Zayn. I mean, he was training for Yanni; he wasn't really training for the world. And, I mean, it kind of just—I guess it kind of just affected those guys, but it definitely affected them guys a little bit. Yeah. Now, the next question from Just a Wrestling Podcast. What do you think is harder to do, take Jaden Cox down or stop Jordan Burroughs' blast double? In JB's prime, it'd definitely have to be his blast double, but now, I mean, i got to go to Jaden Cox. I mean, he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. Didn't give up a point this year at Worlds. Hasn't gotten taken down since last year's semifinals at Worlds. And that was with, that was with the Dogu, the... Two matches with Bo Nickel and Pan Am Games beat the streets. So, I mean, that's tough tournaments in wrestling and did not get taken down. Yeah, definitely. And make sure you guys go check out uh, Just a Wrestling Podcast. It was a, it's a pretty great podcast. Just make sure you guys go check it out and uh, give them a listen. The next question again is from Sam Herring. What are the top three things we need to improve, need to do to improve our Greco standings? I think we need to do a lot more Greco from a young age, and I feel like, I don't know, I feel like colleges now are, like, all over the legs. Like, I feel like it, like if everybody just started working, incorporating a, a little bit more upper body into their, like, arsenal, then I feel like we would be able to do a lot better once we reach the world level. Yeah, I definitely have to say, like, focus on Greco at a young age, and then maybe train Greco, like you said, more often. Like, you guys at uh, RPW have, uh, don't you have Greco once a week, every week? Yeah, so Joe Dignan, he comes in and trains with us, works on some throws and everything, so yeah, it's pretty nice. And then those those are all the questions we had, and then a couple commitments to talk about. Uh, Carter Diver committed to ASU, and uh, it's a pretty big commitment there. Uh, he Arizona State is ranked number uh, five in the country right now. Carter Diver is a returning state champ. Then also uh, Tristan Pugh is going to Appalachian State, and, uh, and I'm really happy for him. And he's I know I've known him for a little bit, and they're both they go both go to Young Guns, and uh, those are two couple that uh, I knew, and then. There's a couple more, like uh, Clayton Early went to is going to Virginia Tech, and uh, Jagger Condomitty is going to Nebraska. The Tristan Pugh is signed up for the surge, so make sure you guys sign up. November 3rd is uh, the wrestling at the UPJ Sports Complex, and make sure you guys sign up for that. It's a great tournament, and I uh, highly suggest it. Yeah, we'll be there to greet you if you decide on coming, so please do. It's a great tournament. There's been a good many place winners there that have placed in the state and couple champions like I know Alejandro Herrera Rondon is signed up uh like you said Tristan Pugh there's a couple other studs like Eric Gibson who is a returning uh third placer in the state for uh Forest Hills and his little brother who is uh Mason Gibson is uh, like two or three times state champ and he's like he's ready to come up through he's really got some potential so come to the serve to prove it yeah mason is uh ranked number one on my junior high big board and uh he could potentially be a five-timer with an eighth grader if he wins if he wins every year yeah he's also ranked number one in flow wrestling's na- national junior high big board too that's all we uh got for it uh you guys today on the, our podcast and uh, thanks for listening and we'll s- catch you next time see ya see ya everybody